There are others there. <laughs> well, thank you. If you would, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 21. It is good to be here today. I have enjoyed being able to come and participate in chapel services for Brooks Bible College over the last few years. Uh, the last year or so, I haven't been able to be here due to various deals, uh, illness in the family, illness in myself, knee surgeries, all sorts of fun stuff. So I'm glad to be able to be back uh, and be here today with my son, Liam. Uh, so you all know he is homeschooled, so please don't call anyone and say that I've taken my kid out of school or something. So uh, he has permission, and this counts in some way towards school for him. So I got his mom's permission, and she's in charge. So anyway, we will be in Luke chapter 21, specifically in verses 34 through 36. Verses 34 through 36. Uh, I'll begin with uh, a, uh, a quote from Zacharias or Sinus. I'm sure you're familiar with him. Uh, Zacharias or Sinus once famously asked a question of his students and colleagues in Germany. And that question was this. What is your only comfort in life and in death? Then her sinus answered that question with these words, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. I'll read that last part again. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. If you would pray with me. Father, we ask that you would bless the reading and the explaining of your word and that your spirit would work and move in our hearts and minds as you promise he will do. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So our passage today comes on the tail end of Jesus' teachings on the last days. Uh, we are not going to spend time considering a chronological order of events that have been proposed through the years However, we are going to consider the reality that there are many who claim the name Christian and claim to have put their hope in Christ Jesus alone that have not really done so, but have instead allowed their passions and their fears to carry them away and then to lead them into fulfilling their sinful inclinations to serve themselves instead of the kingdom of God. So, my prayer is that we prayerfully look at this warning from Christ that is for all generations as we await his second coming to judge sinners for rejecting him as king and as savior. Christ says in Luke chapter 21, verses 34 and 35, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation. Now, this word dissipation basically means it's excessive indulgence, particularly in alcohol, and it results in a hangover. All right, so watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with excessive indulgence and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. So in previous passages leading up to this, Christ has said that he did not want his followers to be burdened by the signs that will precede the destruction of Jerusalem and the signs that will precede his second coming at the end of time. However, here in these few verses, he is not speaking about those signs. Instead, he is warning against falling prey to the things that sinners are most prone to feed in themselves, which are our own passions and our fears. Now, the sense here of this word heart is a person's mind 
where his emotions and his knowledge of right and wrong resides. Therefore, I believe we should understand Christ to be saying, watch yourselves so that your mind, where your emotions and where your conscience reside, that it does not become weighed down. Now we have to look at what weighed down means. The sense here is to experience extreme distress and sorrow because of carrying a burden that is far too heavy to carry. And the result then of carrying such extreme distress and sorrow is that the mind becomes weighed down or we could say clouded and unable to see the things of God clearly. In this sense, the Lord then is saying, be on your guard over your mind or else you will experience extreme distress and sorrow that you were never intended to carry. Things too heavy for you, things you cannot mentally and emotionally handle, things that will crush you under their weight because they steer you away from the ways of God and towards other things that cannot save your souls. Specifically, in this passage, Christ warns his followers to guard themselves so that their minds are not clouded and therefore unable to see and think clearly because of first, dissipation and drunkenness, and then second, because of the cares of this life. And so we're gonna look at these two things separately. First, again, Christ warns his followers to guard their minds so that they are not clouded by dissipation and drunkenness. We need to remember again that dissipation is excessive indulgence in alcohol that results in a hangover, which speaks of a lack of control over one's mind. And a lack of control over one's mind, biblically, is sin. Many times in God's word, believers are instructed to have self-control over their minds, for a lack of self-control will cloud our minds to the point of destruction. We're going to run through a few Proverbs here. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 11 says this, A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. Proverbs 16, verse 32 says, Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. And then Proverbs 25, verse 28 says, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Therefore, Christ warns his followers to guard themselves so that they do not lose control of their minds with excessive alcohol consumption. However, Excessive alcohol consumption that leads to a lack of self-control is not the only thing Christ warns the Christian to guard themselves from, which takes us to the second warning. Christ warns his followers to guard themselves so that their minds are not clouded by the cares of this life. Now, the cares of this life are the things that cause us to feel concern, to worry, to have anxiety, all as the result of circumstances in life that cannot be controlled. Now, there are very real chemical imbalances that cause anxiety in some people. I'm not denying that at all, but that is not what our Lord is speaking about here. Instead, he warns his followers to actively guard their minds from becoming clouded by the cares of this life, those external things that happened around them that they cannot control. This speaks of anxieties that cannot be fixed with medication. We therefore, I believe, can conclude that Jesus is speaking of anxiety that is felt among the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve that find their roots in a lack of control over one's circumstances. Again, the cares of this life are circumstances beyond our control. For example, we cannot in any shape or form control the geopolitical superpowers around us. We're watching things unfold right now in our world that most of us have never experienced before. We cannot control the minute details of our physical health. 
We can't control one another. If we're being honest, we can't control something as small as a bacteria or a virus. It is the hubris of humanity to think that we have control over anything other than the way we personally respond. That's it. And we're warned by Christ that allowing the cares of this life, the anxieties of this life, to weigh us down is a very dangerous place to find ourselves, for it could result in the gospel message being choked out of us. If you would turn to Luke chapter 8, verse 14. Luke chapter 8, verse 14. This is a very familiar passage to us. Explaining the third soil type, Jesus says, And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares, by anxiety over what they cannot control, and riches and pleasures of life, and the result is that their fruit does not mature. Those whose conscience and emotions, those whose minds have become clouded by the cares and the anxieties of life will find the gospel message being choked out of them. There was a good start in the faith, but no perseverance in the faith. For these, as the commentator Stein says, do not continue overcoming until the end. But what we find is that they become weighed down, their minds have become clouded, which results in an inability to see and follow the ways of God. And it is only those who can see and who can follow the ways of God who will persevere until the end. As Christ says to the church of Thyatira, who had become clouded by false teaching. He says in Revelation chapter 2, verses 25 through 28, Only hold fast what you have until I come. He's basically saying, stop. Stop all of this extra stuff that's come in. Only hold fast to what you know from me and me alone, and then the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and then I will give him the morning star. This is the one who's run the race well. This is the one who has reached the prize and attained Christ himself. Christ, however, more than anyone else, understands that life is extremely difficult. When you read the Gospels, we know that Christ understands this. He also knows that life is full of trial and tribulations. But even so, in his final teachings on the last days, he warns his followers to guard their minds from becoming consumed with and focused upon those things that elicit anxiety in them because those things will choke the gospel message out of them. And in the end, when he returns in power and great glory, they may find that they are not his at all, for they cared more for what they could not control in this life than they did for the kingdom of God and the ways of God. And so, we must guard our minds because if we do not and they become clouded we will not be ready for our Savior's imminent return. As Jesus says here again in our passage today in Luke chapter 21 verses 34 and 35 and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap for it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth now, Jesus is not here setting a trap. He's not some angry toddler killing ants with a magnifying glass and burning them to death. That's not what he's talking about. Instead, he is graciously warning sinners that his coming will be sudden and it will be unpredictable. Therefore, today and not tomorrow is the day of repentance for allowing our minds to become clouded by our passions and our fears. And let us be very clear, allowing our minds to become clouded by anything is sin as it keeps us from seeing and following the Word of God. The Word of God that reveals to us our every step in this life. 
If you would, please turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. We're going to look at verses 9 through 16 here. Beginning in verse 9, the psalmist says, How can a young man keep his way pure? Fantastic question. Great question. Uh, now here's the answer. By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your heart word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. If we find that our minds have become clouded by our passions and fears, I believe according to God's word, we can know that it has happened because we have taken our eyes off of the scriptures, looking elsewhere for wisdom and understanding, and are therefore unable to guard ourselves from sinning against the Lord. And we're not talking about a sinless lifestyle. I think most here would know, or hopefully you know it's not what I'm trying to say. But what we are saying is that we are to actively fight to guard our minds from being clouded and controlled by anything other than the Word of God. And definitely not by our passions and our fears. In short, we must not look to the wisdom of this world, but we must instead look to Christ and His Word. Of this, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Every thought means the whole person. Uh, Sproul says this is every idea, motive, desire, and decision. All of these things belong to Christ. When we allow our mind to become clouded by our own passions and fears, our ideas, motives, desires, decisions are no longer being directed under the authority of Christ, but are instead being directed by the things that we have allowed to cloud our minds. And in turn, we sin against God. So the question is, how do we keep from sinning against God? Well, Paul says we must, in our minds, destroy arguments and every lofty opinion. We must destroy in our minds the wisdom of this world that is in opposition to God. We must destroy in our minds any wisdom that does not come from God's word. The next question, I believe, is how do we destroy these things in our minds? Paul says, by taking every thought captive to obey Christ. Why? Because we belong to him. This means that we must not give any unbiblical thought or instruction for living a foothold into our lives, and we should cast these things out before they cloud our minds. Now, we must not hear all of these things and then take them too lightly or so easily point to others that we believe are spiritually clouded. It's easy for us to do. And as those who are serving in ministry already in churches, those who will be serving, those who are around people in general, we know that this is a temptation we have. We hear these things and we say, man, I wish there was a certain person here listening to this right now. We, we must not do that. Instead, may we hear these words and prayerfully weigh them against ourselves for there is urgency in Paul's words, just as there is urgency in the words of Christ from our passage today. So may each of us ask ourselves, has my mind become clouded? Am I unable to clearly see and follow Christ? And if the answer is yes, even if slightly, Christ tells us what we must do. So if you would look at our passage in Luke chapter 21, verse 36. 
Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Christ says, But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. And Christ is not speaking here of having a correct timeline of the end times, nor is he instructing us to keep a physical eye out for his return. Instead, he is instructing his followers to live lives of faithful perseverance. Instead of allowing our minds to become clouded, our Lord who loves us so dearly instructs us to guard our minds from the destructive influence of the things around us. He instructs us to persevere in faithfulness to him despite the things in this life that threaten to weigh us down. Jesus says in Luke chapter 8, verse 15, As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. While the seed that is sown in the thorns is choked out and produces no fruit, the seed that is sown here in the good soil takes deep root and will produce good fruit. Why? Because this is the life that has been transformed from the inside out and will persevere until the very end. A perseverance that is achievable only through prayerful reliance. Prayers that can only be offered by those who belong to Christ Jesus their Lord and therefore those who are able through Christ to offer up such prayers are the only ones who will be ready for the end and able to finish the race well and see Christ return with their own two eyes. This is not speaking about good works either. This is, however, speaking about the work of Christ who has redeemed us with his own precious blood and has saved us from the fiery wrath of God that we deserve. Christians will suffer in this life in many ways. I am sure there are many in this room who have suffered in ways that I don't even understand. And I don't ever want to have to try to figure out how to navigate through. We will experience trials and tribulations of various kinds. It's a promise in God's word. But the gospel will not be choked out of us. Instead, albeit not perfectly, we will, through prayerful reliance on Christ, fight to guard our minds from becoming clouded by our sinful passions and fears in the face of our circumstances. And we will, therefore, be ready for Christ's second coming. But woe to the man who has allowed his mind to become clouded by his passions and fears and is no longer able to clearly see and follow Christ. Woe to the man who self-medicates through drink, through drugs, through food, or even through excessive exercise. And woe to the man who self-medicates with the wisdom of this world because he no longer sees Christ and the ways of God as all he needs to survive the various trials and tribulations. And woe to the man who believes the lies of Satan and thinks and believes that he always has tomorrow to repent and make things right with the Lord. For the Lord will appear suddenly and unpredictably before the eyes of everyone who lives on this earth. And he will appear at a time when we least expect it. Furthermore, woe to the man whose mind is clouded and is, can no longer clearly see and follow the ways of God because he has no life-changing fear of seeing the Son of Man appear in power and great glory. In our passage today, Christ urges us to guard our minds through prayerful reliance on him so that our minds are not clouded by our sinful passions and fears. Christ urges us to not look and focus upon our pains and struggles and tribulations that elicit anxiety, but to look upon Him, for only He can give us eternal peace and rest that begins in this life. So the question is, how do we look to Christ to keep our sinful passions and fears or the wisdom of this world from clouding our minds and leading us into our sins. By asking the Lord for wisdom and prayerfully relying on Him to provide it to us. 
and we should do so without doubting. James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives graciously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. I want to read a commentary note by Kurt Richardson on this. I really don't think I could have done a better job at what he says here. He says, such a double-minded man attempts to live with a contradictory blend of desires from two worlds, but he cannot serve both God and self, the spirit and the flesh, the law of life and the law of death, the wisdom from above and the wisdom from below. Double-mindedness mars a believer's life. No part of it remains unsullied, fulfilled, Filled with ulterior motives, a believer's divided thinking is only indicative of divided loyalties. The source of the believer's struggle with doubt is divided loyalties to the self and to God. But a Christian doubter is an oxymoron. The doubting believer holds back from active trust. Although such people claim to trust in God, they in fact do not. They may pray the prayers of profession, but they do not pray authentically. That is, the prayers of surrender to God's will. James describes such a believer as unstable and restless in everything. So, let's look to the word of our God that he has provided for us because only his word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And let us look to it with prayerful reliance that he will be with us as we seek to obey its truths. So if you would turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. I believe here that the apostle Peter, under the inspiration of the Spirit, gives us godly wisdom clearly. And he explains to us how to look to Christ to keep our sinful passions and fears and the wisdom of this world from clouding and guiding our minds. He says in 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you had suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So today, may we do what we must to guard our minds from being clouded so that we can clearly see and follow our King and Savior in this life and towards eternity. May we abandon the notion of blaming our circumstances or other people for our behavior. For Christ is very clear in our passage today. He tells each of us individually to guard our own minds from our own sinful passions and fears. Things that will crush us under their heavy weight because we were never meant to carry them. So I pray that we lay our burdens down at the feet of Christ so that we may clearly see and follow the will of God in our lives instead of becoming weighed down in this life. As Christ says, so lovingly to us in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let us consider again 
that famous question and response that Ursinus asked his students and colleagues, which became the first question and answer in the Heidelberg Catechism. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation because I belong to Him. Christ, by His Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for Him. Because I belong to Him, Christ, by His Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for Him. Please pray with me. Father, I have to trust that today you've kept your word, that your word will, renever, will never return void, but it will always accomplish in the hearts of sinners what it intends to accomplish. So I pray today, Lord, that your spirit continues to work and move. Convicts us of our sinful passions and fears. And gives us the strength and courage through his work in our lives to lay our heavy burdens down at your feet. And to live for you and you alone without clouded minds. And without clouded loyalties. We love you, Lord, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.